Housing and Urban Affairs will come to order. Uh, this hearing will be in the, uh, the hybrid format as we've done many times. Uh, the, the witnesses in person, the senators can go either way. Uh, and my Senate colleagues uh, will, will be done by seniority, whether you're here or whether you're remote at the gavel. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, yearning for a return to normalcy, millions of American voters elected Joe Biden president of the United States more than a year ago. The American people were exhausted by the divisive rhetoric at neighborhood functions, at church gatherings, at family dinners. They wanted someone who would bring this country together based on our shared values, like the dignity of work. They wanted an economy that works for everyone, not just wealthy elites. That is what we're delivering. Think of where this country was a year ago. Domestic terrorists breached this building a week, a year and a week ago, and assaulted our democracy. Four million more people were out of a job. The hope of vaccines for everyone was just that, a hope. Today, we have made much progress. We have a president committed to democracy, willing to stand in the breach, as he put it last week. Vaccines and booster shots have dramatically lowered the risk for most people, allowed Americans to go back to work, and our children to go back to school safely. We added 6.4 million jobs last year, 6.4 million jobs, the most since 1939. The, nom the nomination we consider today represents another step in President Biden's efforts to rebuild our economy. The president is putting results over partisanship, evidenced by the gentleman sitting at the table, renominating a Federal Reserve chair of the other political party. Jerome Powell served as chair of the Federal Reserve since 2018. He joined the Fed in 2012. He served the country before that in a number of different roles, under Secretary of Finance, under Secretary for Finance at the Treasury Department during the George H.W. Bush administration. As chair, together with President Biden, he helped us deliver historic economic progress. We passed the American Rescue Plan, putting shots in arms and money in pockets. The unemployment rate dropped to 3.9%, down from 6.7%, 6.7% when President Biden raised his right hand. In December alone, we added 800,000 jobs, more than doubling economists' expectations. The economy has regained 8.8, has regained 84% of the jobs we lost since the pandemic hit two years ago. And for some of my colleagues who like to measure the strength of the economy only by the stock market, it was up 20% at the end of 2021. It last year hit record highs 70 different times. We passed an historic jobs bill, the bipartisan infrastructure package, a goal that presidents for decades, presidents of both parties, failed to reach. Chair Powell, along with Vice Chair nominee Leo Brainerd, whom we'll hear from later this week, led the Federal Reserve's unprecedented actions to stabilize our economy in the face of a global pandemic. To his credit, Chair Powell recognized the importance of full employment and what that means for all workers, particularly those at the margins of our economy. He held firm against attempts to politicize the Fed and prevented an economic downturn from becoming far, far worse. He understands the best way to bounce back from this crisis is to get the coronavirus under control with vaccines. Today, we're at a critical moment for the first time in decades. Workers are finally, finally starting to get a little bit more bargaining power. Wages are growing faster, faster than inflation, faster than we've seen in over a decade. Americans are leaving jobs that didn't work for them and their families. They're finding better ones, often with higher paychecks. Corporations call this, quote, a labor shortage. To me, it looks like the free, free labor market at work at its best. Of course, we still have challenges. We've seen severe supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic because for decades, corporations put short-term profits over long-term term resilience, lobbying this body for what turned out to be bad trade agreements and bad tax policy. The fragile supply chains stretching all over the globe are not easily fixed. These disruptions, along with corporate opportunism, are raising the cost of many consumer goods. That adds to the costs that have been growing more unaffordable for decades, from childcare to prescription drugs to housing. While paychecks are starting to go up, wages are still far from keeping up with corporate profits. We've only just begun the work of empowering American workers in reorienting our economy from Wall Street to Main Street. Some are suggesting, though, 
that the Fed pull back on the support of the broader economy and make it harder for people to get jobs. That's all, that's generally what happens. Economist lingo tends to mask what we're really talking about when it comes to the Fed's work. So let's be clear. President Biden put it pretty well last week. Taking the example of the price of cars, he said we have two options. We can increase the supply of cars by making more of them, or we can reduce demand for cars by making Americans poorer. That's the choice we face. When people talk about cooling off the economy, what they really mean is making it harder for people to find jobs and stopping paychecks from growing. And we know how this goes. The cooling off never seems to extend to corporate profits or executives' pay. The Fed must not allow only Wall Street to recover while working Americans are left behind. We've seen that story unfold far, far too many times before. Today, banks are quietly celebrating one of their most profitable years ever with huge bonuses and payouts. The Fed must do more to stop consolidation in the banking industry from hurting consumers and small businesses. It must encourage more lending to Main Street and crack down on stock buybacks and risky bets at the biggest banks. And the Fed needs to take seriously the systemic risks that threaten our economic progress, like cryptocurrencies and stable coins, and most importantly, climate change. Chair Powell Shoney understands, in his words, profound challenges for the global economy and financial system, unquote. If confirmed, we expect him to take what he's promised will be bold steps to tackle these risks. Chair Powell, Vice Chair uh, nominee Brainerd, have also begun important work with the FDIC and the OCC to update the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, regulations completing that update is essential to increase bank service to an investment in all the communities that have been left on their own for too long. We expect also expect reform inside the Federal Reserve System it means increasing diversity at the Fed so the people making decisions for our economy actually reflect the workers who power that economy. It's something the Fed's entire history has been frankly shameful about. As Chair Powell said, if entrenched inequities prevent some Americans from participating fully in our labor, labor markets, not only will they be held back from opportunities, but our economy overall will not realize its potential. Good words from the chair on that. Many of us have appreciated those words, but now we expect action. In all of this work, the American people must be able to trust that the Federal Reserve works for them, that officials aren't abusing their positions for personal gain. Recent revelations about the Fed's ethics scandal have confirmed a lot of people's worst suspicions about government officials. As chair of the Fed, Mr. Powell has a responsibility to restore that trust. The Fed plays a central role in how we want our economy to work. We can't have a Fed that returns to business as usual because, frankly, that just didn't work for most Americans. Chair Powell, President Biden nominated you to grow the economy for all Americans, not just those at the top, and to protect that growth from threats to our financial system like risky Wall Street schemes and crypto bubbles and increasing climate disasters. We expect you to meet these challenges. I believe you've shown the leadership to do so. We will be watching closely. Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, congratulations on your renomination. As I have said, I intend to vote in favor of extending your chairmanship. Let me uh, briefly explain why. Uh, there's a broad bipartisan backing for Chairman Powell's renomination because he has a record of acting thoughtfully and constructively, especially in some very difficult circumstances. First, he did implement a number of modest, sensible reforms that reduced regulatory burdens, including on small banks, and helped to encourage economic growth. Second, when the pandemic hit nearly two years ago and governments worldwide began to shut down their economies, credit markets seized up and the economy teetered on the brink of collapse. But with Congress's help, Chairman Powell acted swiftly and appropriately to stabilize the financial markets and the economy. And to his critics who claim that the regulatory reforms that he spearheaded would hasten the collapse of the banking system, we now know that's clearly empirically false. After the pandemic caused the economy to nearly collapse, our country emerged with the most well-capitalized banks in history. It was and still is abundantly clear that those regulatory reforms did not come at the expense of financial stability. Of course, none of the Fed's pandemic actions came without a cost. This negative real interest rate environment continues to distort markets, risk asset, asset bubbles, and punish savers. And the Fed has dramatically expanded its balance sheet with trillions of dollars in government bonds, effectively monetizing a lot of debt and facilitating profligate government spending. 
For the past 18 months, I cautioned that the Fed was fighting the last war, a mystery pathogen that led governments to collectively shut down the global economy when, in fact, a new enemy had arrived, and that was inflation. I'm relieved the Fed has acknowledged inflation is running well above and longer than its initial projections. In response, the Fed has accelerated the termination of its bond buying program, and FOMC participants appear to be accelerating the process to normalize interest rates. These are welcome developments. But I do remain concerned with the Fed's actions going forward. First, I worry that the Fed's extraordinary response to the crisis could become the new normal for monetary policy. We're more than a year into a record economic expansion, with unemployment at near all-time lows, and yet the Fed is still today buying government and agency securities. Having continued QE throughout the recovery was, in my view, a mistake. It's contributed to asset bubbles, distorted markets, and a suboptimal allocation of capital, credit, and resources, all of which ultimately lead to lower economic growth. Second, I worry that the Fed's new monetary policy framework has contributed to the Fed being behind the curve as we are seeing inflation running at a 39-year high. Under this new framework, the Fed intentionally tolerates above-target inflation for an indeterminate period of time. Under the old approach, the Fed may have acted last April when we first passed a 4% inflation rate. We haven't seen that in some time. Beyond monetary policy, I'm deeply concerned to see the Fed, especially at the regional banks, wade into politically charged areas like global warming and so-called racial justice. Regional banks have hosted multiple symposia on these issues that consistently embrace and advance a particular liberal political agenda. And the Fed itself joined the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system. The network's stated aim is to use financial regulation to, and I quote, mobilize mainstream finance to support the transition toward a sustainable economy, end quote. In other words, to direct credit away from the fossil fuel sector. The troubling politicization of the Fed puts its independence and effectiveness at risk. The Fed has been granted operational independence to protect monetary policy from short-sighted political interests. And in turn, the Fed has operated largely apolitically to great effect. There's a kind of bargain here. The Fed is given independence on the assumption it will only engage in areas in which it has a mandate. That makes sense. But if the Fed is going to stray from its mandate and become a political actor advocating a certain set of social policy, then there's no way it's going to maintain its independence from the political branches of government that are actually responsible for those topics. The Fed does not have a mandate to advance politically charged causes that are irrelevant to its mandate, like global warming or advancing so-called racial justice. And to make matters worse, when I've sought to understand these developments at the regional banks, I've been met with unacceptable noncompliance with reasonable requests. So let me be clear, if this politicization continues unchecked, it will not end well for the Fed or for independently driven monetary policy. As the Fed's leader, I hope you take this seriously and rein it in to protect the Fed's legitimacy and independence. Now, I've observed that the Fed has had the good sense to adjust its behavior as the facts and circumstances regarding inflation have come in differently than were expected. Unfortunately, we've seen no such humility or recognition of reality from the Biden administration or our Democratic colleagues. They appear set on making the inflationary problem worse, further causing declines in real wages, with more reckless spending that gooses demand and regulatory and protectionist policies that limit supply that in combination ultimately push prices for basic goods higher. The crisis we face now is inflation, complicated by policymakers who unwisely behave as if it's still March of 2020. The Fed cannot correct for policy failures like school closures and government-induced business shutdowns or misguided expansions of the welfare state, nor should it try. Chairman Powell, the role of the Fed chairman is crucial for our shared economic prosperity. I was encouraged to see your renomination, and I hope that you will do everything in your power to ensure that the Fed operates within its limited mandate to effectively support the American economy. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Uh, Chair Powell, please rise. Uh, raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Do you agree or to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the United States Senate? Thank you. Please be seated. 
Chair Powell, we welcome you to the committee. If you'd like to introduce family or friends, feel free. Uh, please begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is this on? Yes, thank you. Uh, I didn't bring any uh, family or, or friends here today in light of the uh, limited seating circumstances, so I'll, but I will mention them in my testimony. Thank you. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, uh, and other members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'd like to thank President Biden for nominating me to serve a second term as chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. I would also like to thank my colleagues throughout the Federal Reserve System for their dedication, perseverance, and tireless work on behalf of the American people. Their commitment and expertise were essential to the Fed's response to the COVID-19 crisis and remain vital to the implementation of monetary policy as our economy continues to progress. Particular thanks go to my wife, Alyssa Leonard, and our three children, Susie, Lucy, and Sam. Their love and support make possible everything I do. My five siblings are all watching, or will later claim to have watched. <laughs> and we are thinking of each other and of our parents today with love and gratitude. Four years ago, when I sat before this committee, few could have predicted the great challenges that would soon become ours to meet. On the eve of the pandemic, the US economy was enjoying its 11th year of expansion, the longest on record. Unemployment was at 50-year lows, and the economic benefits were reaching those most on the margins. No obvious financial or economic imbalances threatened the ongoing expansion. But this attractive picture turned virtually overnight as the virus swept across the globe. The initial contraction was the fastest and deepest on record, but the pain could have been much worse. As the pandemic arrived, our immediate challenge was to stave off a full-scale depression which would require swift and strong policy actions from across government. Congress provided by far the fastest and largest response to any post-war economic downturn. At the Fed, we used the full range of policy tools at our disposal. We moved quickly to restore vital flows of credit to households, communities, and businesses, and to stabilize the financial system. These collective policy actions, the development and availability of vaccines, and American resilience worked in concert, first to cushion the pandemic's economic blows and then to spark a historically strong recovery. Today, the economy is expanding at its fastest pace in many years, and the labor market is again strong. As always, challenges remain. Both the individual shutdown and the subsequent reopening of the economy were without precedent. The economy has rapidly gained strength despite the ongoing pandemic, giving rise to persistent supply and demand imbalances and bottlenecks and to elevated inflation. We know that high inflation exacts a toll, particularly for those less able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are strongly committed to achieving our statutory goals of maximum employment and price stability. We will use our tools to support the economy and a strong labor market and to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched. We can begin to see that the post-pandemic economy is likely to be different in some respects, and the pursuit of our goals will need to take those differences into account. To that end, monetary policy must take a broad and forward-looking view, keeping pace with an ever-evolving economy. Over the past four years, my colleagues and I have continued the work of our predecessors to ensure a strong and resilient financial system. We increased capital and liquidity requirements for the largest banks, and currently, capital and liquidity levels at our largest, most systemically important banks are at multi-decade highs. We worked to improve the public's access to instant payments, intensified our focus and supervisory efforts on evolving threats such as climate change and cyber attacks, and expanded our analysis and monitoring of financial stability. We will remain vigilant about new and emerging threats. We also updated our monetary policy framework drawing on insights from people and communities across the country to reflect the challenges of conducting policy in an era of persistently low interest rates. Congress has assigned the Federal Reserve important goals and has given us considerable independence in using our tools to achieve them. In our democratic system, 
That independence comes with responsibility of transparency and clear communication to keep the public informed and enable effective legislative oversight. That duty takes on even greater significance when the Fed must take extraordinary actions in times of crisis. In order to facilitate that transparency and to earn your trust and that of the American people, I have made it a priority to meet regularly and frequently with you and your elected colleagues, and I commit to continuing that practice if I'm confirmed to another term. The Federal Reserve works for all Americans. We know our decisions matter to every person, family, business, and community across the country. I am committed to making those decisions with objectivity, integrity, and impartiality, based on the best available evidence and in the long-standing tradition of monetary policy independence. That pledge lies at the heart of the Fed's mission and is one we all make when we answer the call to public service. I make it here again with force and without reservation. Everything we do at the Federal Reserve is in pursuit of the goals set for us by Congress. I am honored to have worked in service to those ends since I joined the Fed in 2012 and as chair for the past four years. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, many, many working Americans are concerned about rising prices, and I think President Biden's decision to renominate you to a second term as chair shows he's confident you'll continue to lead our economy through this ongoing crisis. In November, you indicated that the rise of the Omicron variant, uh, 586,000 new cases daily over the last week, that the rise of the Omicron variant posed significant risks to employment and economic activity. Do you agree that higher prices are related to the supply and demand imbalances that can be traced directly back to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy? Yes, yes, I do. For the most part, um, if you look back, and you can trace to developments, including strong demand and also supply constraints. <laughs> Thank you. Um, last year, uh, FSOC, released its report on climate-related financial risk, which describes how climate change is a threat to our financial stability. In the past, you've said, your words, climate change is an emerging risk to financial institutions, the financial system, and the economy, end quote. Well, uh, Chair Powell, will the Fed follow the FSOC report's recommendations, including implementing climate stress tests for the biggest banks? We are looking at climate stress tests. I, I think it's very likely that climate stress, uh, stress scenarios, as we like to call them, will be a key tool going forward. I would stress that those are very different from the regular stress tests, which affect capital. Climate stress scenarios at this stage are really about uh, assuring that the large financial institutions understand all of the risks that they're, mm -hmm. that they're taking, including uh, the risks that may be inherent in their business model regarding uh, climate change over time. Will you make this a top priority if confirmed to another term? Uh, yes, it will be. I would say within supervision, um, uh, as I mentioned, that will be that is likely to be a, a very important priority over the coming years. The, the position of vice chair of supervision, but also yours? Yes. Uh, it's the Fed's responsibility, as you know, to promote financial stability. It means we need strong financial safeguards in place to protect American workers and families from risks in our financial system. It's all that. Uh, Chair Powell, recently the Fed has refocused its full employment objectives to make sure it includes workers of all backgrounds. Do you agree that when all workers, including women, including black and brown workers, are able to fully participate in the workforce that our economy grows, and do you think it's important for the Fed to understand and proactively, proactively address racial and gender, gender disparities in wealth and income and employment in our country? So what we saw at the end of the last very long, longest in our history expansion was that as the labor market tightened, the benefits began to go more broadly to those at the lower end of the income spectrum and to groups that have been more marginalized from an economic standpoint. And uh, that's, that was seen, I think, very broadly as a highly desirable set of outcomes. So our tools do not generally have uh, direct distributional effects, but I, did, I do think that we see now uh, the great benefits that a strong labor market can bring to, you know, right across the whole population and for the whole economy. But you are suggesting from your answer that only when 
there is strong demand for labor do people who are more on the margins of society people of color women people who have not done as well only then will they benefit does the fed have responsibility beyond that well of course we have responsibilities in bank supervision and community affairs and and uh, fair lending and things like that but just focusing on monetary policy our principal uh tool is interest rates and and they they affect demand over time and I do think uh, the main thing that we can do is to uh, make sure that, uh, you know, consistent with the infl inflation side of our mandate, that we do foster a strong uh, employment market. Is part of that uh, a more diverse workforce at the Fed? So we, as you know, we work very hard to uh, to achieve diversity, and as as all major American institutions, public and private, do these days, we certainly do, and we do. Th we think that having a diverse workforce is um, it makes us better at doing our jobs, uh, and so we it's a it's a it's an important focus and, and a high priority. Okay, thank you, Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, uh, we, we all noted with great interest the, the shift in the Fed's uh, focus, the acceleration of the tapering, and the indication that FOMC members expect now a series of interest rate increases this year. I'm trying to understand uh, where this leads to, and I wonder if you could comment on um, the fact that if we had three or even four 25 basis point increases in overnight rates, we would still, in my view, have a very accommodative stance with negative real short-term rates. Is it your view that it's realistic to bring inflation back to the target level if short-term interest rates are negative, uh, real rates? So I the, the way I would look at it is this. What we have now is a mismatch between demand and supply. We have very strong demand in areas where, where supply is constrained, particularly around goods, particularly around things like cars. So um, we have to, how are, the, how are those two things going to get into better, better into alignment? Well, part of the answer is going to be through shifts in demand, and, and we think that, we'll, that part of it will be through the return of greater supply. So I, I don't think we, we look to get all of the um, realignment between demand and supply through the demand channel, although we should get some. But at the same time, we do think we'll get over the course of this year uh, return to normal supply conditions, and that's going to affect our policy. I, I will say, though, if you know, if 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 we see inflation persisting at high levels longer than expected, then then we will, you know, then we'll if we have to raise interest rates more over time, we will. We will use our tools to get inflation back, and, and the main reason is this, uh, a reason is this, that to get the kind of uh, very strong labor market we want with high participation, it's going to take a long expansion. We can see that participation is moving only very slowly, and to get a long expansion, we're going to need price stability. Right. And so in, in a way, high inflation is, is, a, is a severe threat to the achievement of maximum employment and to achieving a long expansion that can give us that. Uh, I think that's a very important point. Let, let me also just ask you, um, as I mentioned, I understood the need for quantitative easing, the extraordinary measures that we're taking during the crisis. But I worry that the Fed's decision to continue to use these policies well after the crisis had passed, and in fact we're in the midst of a strong recovery, increases the risk of normalizing behavior like this bond buying. So I think it's your view that it's important that this not become normal routine uh, part of Fed behavior. Um, but could you clarify that? And if it is important that this not become a routine matter, how do we ensure that it doesn't? So I, I guess I would start by saying that the, the last two uh, downturns have, there's been nothing normal about them. It's, they've been his, two historically large uh, downturns, one being the global financial crisis and one being the pandemic, and we did we were called to use to invent new tools and use all of our tools. Um, if we had a so really, if we had a regular way recession, a couple of quarters of negative growth, a typical um, recession, then the question would be, what do we need to do? And so, in this era of, of very low interest rates, there's not going to be as much room to cut, but that would be the first thing that we would do. Now, the, as just because we are, we, we have been uh, and 
probably remain in an era of very low interest rates, we would have to look at asset purchases as the next tool in line, but we wouldn't, I don't think we'd automatically use it unless it was necessary. I would certainly hope we wouldn't automatically use it. I would hope that there would be a very, very high threshold to get over, um, especially when you consider the ways in which it distorts um, uh, the allocation of capital. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, one of the things I'm very concerned about is the, uh, especially the regional banks having strayed from the Fed's statutory mission on monetary policy into inappropriate and overtly political advocacy. It's one of many, many examples. The Boston Fed conducted a virtual event as part of its Racism and the Economy series in which the speakers routinely and adamantly called for defunding the police. Just nothing to do with the Fed's mandate. For seven months now, I've been asking for information from several regional banks about their political activism. And for seven months, they have simply refused to comply with my request. So I've requested some documentation from the main Fed with respect to this activity, all of which, by the way, is subject to FOIA in any case. Now, I'm sure it's not your opinion that the ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee is entitled to less information than a member of the general public would get through a FOIA request. So can you commit to getting me the information that is now long overdue? So I, I am aware that, that, uh, that you have submitted a FOIA request and we're processing it now. And I, I don't know what's asked for. I don't know whether it's actually covered by FOIA. But to the extent that it is, you'll, of course, get it. Uh, I, I think it's very important that this committee and Congress uh, understand how the Fed reaches decisions to engage in political advocacy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Toomey, Senator uh, Reed from Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Powell. Congratulations on your renomination. I believe that President Biden has made two excellent choices, uh, yourself and uh, Governor Bernard. Uh, I think You've worked together hand in hand for many years. I think you'll be a superb team. And so I look forward to supporting your nomination and Governor Bernard's nomination also for vice chair. And let me join my colleagues in uh, commending you for an exceptional job with respect to the pandemic. Uh, one of the interesting uh, consequences of the pandemic and the, the employment market is that we've seen uh, wages rise. In fact, we've seen them rise with respect to uh, factory workers, not supervisory personnel, about 5.8 percent. And my concern uh, is would an increase in interest rates in anywhere begin to s slow down that rise or, or indeed re reverse it? So like you and I think like everyone, uh, we think uh, wages moving up is generally a good thing. Um, but uh, if you look back through history, there are times when, um, w when wages have moved up in a way that has fostered persistent inflation. And that hurts everyone. It particularly hurts people on fixed income. So we don't see that right now. Uh, but we do see these are the biggest wage increases in, in decades. And so we're watching carefully. and, and um, uh, uh, you know, to the extent we are uh, looking at this year, what we see is an economy that where the labor market is recovering incredibly rapidly, uh, really beginning around the end of the, the middle of, of uh, last year. The, the unemployment rate's been dropping at more than three tenths of a percent per month since uh, since last June. It's now below four uh, percent. It's which is pretty close to half you know half century lows. So that 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 part is of the employment market is, is, uh, is doing very well. Meanwhile, inflation is running very well, very far above our target. And what that's telling us is that the economy no longer needs or wants the very highly accommodative policies that we've had in place to deal with the pandemic and the aftermath. So that, that's what that's really about. We're, we're really just going to be moving over the course of this year to a policy that is closer to normal, but it's a long road to normal from where we are. Where right now we are very highly accommodative, and it's, it is really time for us to begin to move away from those emergency pandemic settings to a more normal level. It shouldn't. It really should not have negative effects on the employment market. Which uh, it's ironic because, uh, as you pointed out in your opening statement, uh, when you 
took over, uh, we had 11 straight years of significant economic growth, but that was not translated into the wages of most working people, particularly um, entry level and non-factory workers, et cetera. And now we're, we've seen a situation where that's reversed, and I would hope that we could continue that type of, uh, of progress. Uh, and I, and I, I know you'll be sensitive to, to that going forward. Uh, one of the interesting things about the, the situation we face now is that the Fed tools are probably most effective uh, reducing overall demand. Uh, but a lot of what we're facing is supply problems. Uh, you know, the, the situation about automobiles, well, the, the problem there, in fact, I think used cars are so expensive, they're distorting the inflation numbers significantly. And that's a result of a shortage of uh, microchips and other types of chips, which is a result of the pandemic. These are supply issues. So to what extent uh, will your dealing with demand help supply? And maybe that's the real problem. No, it really won't. It, it's, we, we really can't affect, directly affect uh, supply side conditions. And that's why I mentioned it's, th this is really is a, a problem both of very strong elevated demand, particularly in a part of the economy, the goods sector, the durable goods sector, things like washing machines and cars and all the things that people bought during the course of the pandemic when they couldn't spend money on travel and services, that's where there's spending is running at a level 20 percent above where it was before the pandemic, and it's just kind of overwhelmed the supply chains, most of which are global in these days. You're getting parts and, and, and fully assembled products coming in. So we, we, we can affect the demand side. Uh, we can't affect the supply side, but this really is a combination of the two. Well, and a, f a final point I want to make uh, is that uh, the issue of climate change is absolutely critical. It's an economic issue. Uh, I don't think you want to see a lot of uh, uh, banks owning property that's literally underwater. Uh, but if you look at any of the analysis going forward, that could be the case. So I would hope that the Fed would uh, view this as an economic issue and pursue it as an economic issue that's going to affect us uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, my colleague, Senator Whitehouse, has been one of the most staunch visionaries and advocates for that position. And I hope the Fed is responsive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Reed. Senator uh, Shelby from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, welcome back to the committee. You've spent a lot of time with us in, in the past. Um, inflation is currently surging at its highest rate in 40 years. Uh, and while I appreciate the decision that the Fed has uh, made to begin tapering, I'm concerned that the Fed missed the boat on addressing inflation sooner. A lot of us are. And as, as a result of that, the Fed, under your leadership, has lost a lot of credibility. Uh, I only have a little time, so I have a number of questions, and I know you can probably remember them. But maybe together we'll remember them all. But uh, I'd like to touch on this, if you would, I'd like for you to. Why did the Federal Reserve initially forecast inflation to be transitory? Secondly, has your view on the threat of inflation changed? Why? What assurances can you provide here today that the Fed has a better grasp uh, today on inflation than a year ago and so forth? And what factors have caused the U.S. to have greater increases in inflation, in inflation compared to other development, developed countries? And I guess lastly, uh, yes, how important is price stability? to the American people? And that's a lot of questions, but these are all relevant to your job. Thank you. Respecting your time, let me, let me go right through these. First, let me say price stability is half of our mandate. There's no basis in the law for preferring maximum employment over price stability uh, or vice versa. They're equal. However, uh, at different times, one of them is farther away from its goal, and, and that's the one we need to focus on a little bit more. Sometimes that's maximum employment. Sometimes it's inflation. I'd say now it's inflation. So on inflation, wh why do we say transitory? We, did, we said that because we thought that these supply side uh, bottlenecks and shortages would be alleviated much more quickly than they have been. There's no empirical experience with this before. We haven't had the global supply chain collapse. Uh, we haven't had this kind of a labor force uh, shock before. So we and essentially all other mainstream forecasters 
forecast that, that, that by now we'd be seeing much lower inflation. And that, that's, that's not what happened. So what, what, uh, what's changed is that, just as I mentioned, the, the supply side constraints have, be, have been very persistent and very durable. We're not seeing really a lot of progress. Uh, if you look across you know, the global supply chains and what's happening domestically, look at our ports, look at, look at Long Beach and LA, the two big ports on the West Coast for Asia, the, the, the number of ships at anchor is, is it still at a record level. So we're not really seeing yet the kind of progress we essentially uh, all forecasters really thought we'd be seeing by now. And that's, that's really what's driving it. I think we did foresee the, the strong spike in demand. Um, we didn't know that it would, that it would be so focused on, on goods. But so that's really what happened. And I, so I think we learned that. It wasn't that um, it was just it, it, this is a unique set of circumstances. We haven't had really the United States economy is so dynamic. The supply side adapts quickly. And, you know, there are new companies being started and old companies dying all the time. This is a situation where there actually are hard constraints. People want to buy cars. Car, car makers can't make any more cars because there are no semiconductors. So that's, that's never happened. I can't think of another example of that. And that's true across. Um, so what factors really? It's the supply side. Um, did I miss any? I think I like to think I covered at least touched all five of those. What uh, have you really learned and, and you would share with your uh, fellow uh, Board of Governors uh, to get a grasp as much as you can on inflation? Because we, a lot of us have been on the committee a while and we remembered what Dr. Volcker did with the Fed under his leadership. And it was draconian, but it worked. Uh, I hope we won't have to do that, but it, you've got to do whatever you have to do, have you? Do you agree? We, we have to achieve price stability, and I, I believe we will, and I'm confident we will. And again, it's not, it, it's not just a question of restraining demand, although that, that will be... We, we, right now, we're stimulating demand with very highly accommodative policy. As we move through this year, we will, we will, in all likelihood, we don't know the future, but if things develop as expected, we'll be normalizing policy, meaning we're going to end our asset purchases in March, meaning we'll be raising rates over the course of the year. At some point, perhaps later this year, we will start to allow the balance sheet to run off. And that's just the road to normalizing policy. That, that, that's what we're going to be doing. Um, and uh, of course, we're committed. I, but we also be, we do believe, and I, I think widely it is believed, that, that these supply blockages will be alleviated too so that there will be more supply as well, more labor force. But people will be coming back into the labor force. We'll see more recovery, although it's been slow from participation. And we'll see these global supply blockages coming down. We will, we'll see some more cars, although that's going to take some time. And that will help as well, getting supply and demand back, back at the same level. Senator Menendez from New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chair Powell, let me start by reiterating a point uh, that I've made, uh, unfortunately, far too many times. And the latest batch of uh, nominees uh, leads me to, once again, the conclusion that there is a serious diversity problem at the Federal Reserve. Latinos are the country's largest minority. They make up nearly 20 percent of the entire U.S. population. It's outrageous that they have no representation in Fed leadership. There's never been a single member of the Board of Governors or regional bank president that has lived the experience of being a Latino in the United States. And that means that the voices of one-fifth of the country's citizens are repeatedly drowned out when the Fed is making critical decisions on economic policy, decisions that affect whether a Latino family can afford their first home, find a job that pays a living wage, send their children to college, save for a comfortable retirement, or get a loan to expand their business. In late October, several of my colleagues and I sent you a letter requesting that you work closely with the Boston and Dallas banks to recruit diverse candidates for their open president positions. We received your response to that letter just last week, and I have to be honest with you, the lack of detail was thoroughly disappointing. I'd be expecting you to provide a more detailed update on the search process before your confirmation vote, including what specific changes you've made to the process and how they're going to lead to a more diverse candidate 
pool, and I hope that you will do that. While we face uh, significant challenges with the Omicron variant and supply chain disruptions that are both causing families to face higher prices for a variety of goods, the fact is that we're experiencing a strong recovery from an unprecedented pandemic. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan and other policies put in place by Congress and the Biden administration, we gained an average of 537,000 jobs per month since President Biden took office. So, Chairman Powell, if you're confirmed, how would you continue to balance the Fed's dual mandate to keep price increases manageable while not dampening the strong job and wage growth that we've seen over the past year? So, by, by so many measures, labor demand relative to supply is, is at its highest level, really, that, that I can remember. Uh, the level of job openings is at an all-time high as a percentage of the labor force. The level of quits um, or is labor economists look at the level of quits as a real indicator of how strong the labor market, the percentage of quits, the number of quits is at an all-time high. So um, the, it, the, the problem is not lack of demand for, for labor. The problem is that there, there's a significant supply problem, problem, which is associated with the pandemic and a range of other factors. Participation has not recovered. But as you can see, for people who are in the labor force, the unemployment rate is dropping at historically fast levels. So uh, we don't have a, a labor demand problem to solve by, by through our policy. What we have is a labor supply problem. So what is the threat? We're, on, we're clearly on a path to have an even better labor market over time. What, is the, what are the big threats to our getting there? Well, I would say right very near the top of the list is the threat of, of price stability. It, of, of If inflation does become too persistent, if these high levels of inflation get entrenched in our economy and in people's thinking, then, then inevitably that will lead to much tighter monetary policy from us, and it could, could lead to a recession, and that will be bad for workers. So really, it, 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 to achievement of maximum employment, by which we really mean uh, continued progress in hiring and, and in participation, is going gonna, is gonna to require price stability, and that's going to require us to, to use our tools to the extent they work on the, on the demand side, mm -hmm. while we also expect uh, some help from the supply side. Do you expect inflation to subside as vaccinations increase and supply chains are repaired? Over time, yes. Over time, the question is how fast and the risks that we're running in the meantime that inflation psychology starts to get entrenched. But certainly, I believe that. And I, I, you, you make a great point about, about vaccination. Getting ahead of the pandemic, I mean, I don't think two years ago we thought we'd still be having record levels of cases and even record, close to record levels of hospitalizations. Getting past the pandemic is the single most important thing we can do. Now, finally, according to the New York Times, New Jersey and other parts of the Northeast were hit particularly hard at the beginning of the pandemic and during the most recent surge, mm -hmm. while the Midwest was most strongly affected in November of 2020 and the South at the end of last summer. How closely... Does the Fed look at differences in regional performance when making policy decisions? We, we have to focus on, on the national level, but of course we follow, uh, in this instance, the, 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 the earlier Delta, for example, kind of rolled, COVID rolled around the country on a regional basis. That's not so much the case with Omicron. It's so contagious, and, and it's not the same everywhere, but it really is going through the whole country at a pretty rapid rate, but we, we follow that very, very carefully. You know, we, I, I would say we didn't know much about vaccines and, and um, pandemics two years ago, but we've all had two years to learn. So, but we, you know, we defer to the experts though. We don't, we don't, we don't substitute our judgment on medical issues for the experts, but we talk to them all the time. All right. Well, I look forward to following up with you on the diversity question. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Crapo is recognized from Idaho from his office, I believe. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Chair Powell, welcome back to the committee. Uh, when you last appeared before this, I also asked you about an expected Fed report on digital currencies. You indicated that delays in releasing the report were because the Fed wanted to ensure that their analysis was correct and to complete and, and that a release was expected in the coming weeks. However, that report still has not been released. Do you have an update you can share on the status of the report? And are there problems with sharing this 
support with Congress and the public and what the Fed may be proposing with respect to possibly centralizing uh, public digital currency? So the, the report really is ready to go, and I would expect we will drop it. I hate to say it again in coming weeks, but it really is in, in a situation where it's ready to go. The fall for us, uh, given uh, you know changes in monetary policy and other things going on, it was hard to, to – we didn't get it uh, – um, quite to where we needed to get it, but it's effectively there now. And I, I will tell you, it's we're, you know, it, it's w within weeks we will be uh, publishing it. And by the way, it's more it's more going to be an exercise in asking questions and seeking input from the public rather than taking a lot of positions uh, on 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 various issues. Although we do take some positions. All right, thank you. Well, as uh, I hope that you'll be able to meet this um, couple of weeks. Uh, projection. As you know, I've been asking you and uh, other members of the Fed about this uh, for a long time, and uh, we really do believe it's time that the Fed release this report so that we can engage in the further discussion of it. Uh, I want to also, uh, with the rest of the, my time, go back to the issue of inflation. You, I know you've talked about it a lot with us this morning. Uh, in response to my questioning about inflation last November, you confirmed that inflationary pressures would certainly last in your work through the middle of of uh, this year, of this coming year. What do you now expect with, with the time we've seen since you last answered these questions in front of the committee? What do you now expect inflationary pressures to look like throughout this year? I wouldn't say things have changed much on that front since last November. I think that inflationary pressures do seem to be on track to last well into the middle of next year. And if they last longer than that, then I'll just say that our policy will continue to adapt. Our, our policy has been adapting to this, um, you know, for some months. Uh, but we'll, if, if, it, if inflation is going to last longer, then that would, that would potentially imply more risk of, of, of its persistence and ultimately becoming entrenched, and, and our policy will respond accordingly. Um, you just said well into the middle of next year. Did you mean this year or ne yeah. through all year and then I, next year? I meant, I meant this year. You're right. I still think it's 2021 sometimes. <laughs> hey, I thought so, but I wanted to be sure what you were saying. Um, you know, with regard to the question of what's going to happen over the next three to four months uh, as we try to deal with the inflationary pressures you've described, if consumer price inflation were to persist over the next three or four months at somewhere between five and seven percent, as we are now seeing, and if the unemployment rate were to remain about where it is now, uh, below four percent, uh, what would you expect the tools that the Fed would need to use uh, would be? And I noted in one of your responses on the inflation issue uh, earlier today, I thought I heard you say that the uh, Fed's uh, overnight interest rate would still, even after you may use it as a tool, would still be very low. Uh, could, could you just discuss to the, I know you can't predict with specificity what the Fed would do, but could you discuss what you expect interest rates to look like as you utilize uh, that tool? Sure. So I, I, I think to your point, um, you know, we're at a place where unemployment is now very low, historically low, and inflation is well above target, and the economy no longer needs these, um, this very highly accommodative stance of policy. And I would expect that this year, 2022, will be a year in which we take steps toward normalization. That will involve raising the federal funds rate. That will involve ending asset purchases in March. And perhaps later this year, depending on the run of things, uh, we, would, we would also see ourselves beginning to allow the balance sheet to shrink. So that's, that's what I, I think that's, that's the broad picture of what I, what I see happening. Um, the committee hasn't made any decisions about the timing of any of that. And it's, I think we're going to have to be both humble and a bit nimble here. We, um, you know, if you go back and look at where, where we were a year ago today in the economy, um, you know, vaccines were arriving. I think that in my thinking there was, a, there was the idea that will, that will really help us get past the pandemic. And it, it has helped a lot, but yet we're at all-time record cases and, and, and approaching record uh, hospitalizations nationally. So uh, the thing has stayed with us longer, and I think we're going to have to be open to the changing environment, and, and monetary policy is going to have to adapt uh, as, as we learn more. And then we're going to learn a lot about the path of inflation, 
particularly uh, as it relates to these supply-side blockages we've had over the course of the first six months of the year and, and every month, really. So do I understand, are, are you saying that if the pandemic remains uh, problematic and aggressive, that that would uh, impact the timing of the of any decisions the Fed might make in terms of the federal funds rate? So I, I'd say it could, but you know, the, what's happened is the economy has made all these gains in the face of two. During 2021, we had two major uh, pandemic out- outbreaks, two variant outbreaks, and and really the beginning of 21 was dominated by a very strong wave of of the original COVID. So, and yet the economy. We made tremendous progress in the labor market in 2021, and, and growth is at a multi-decade high in 2021. So I expect the economy to continue to, to be able to deal with these, um, uh, with these outbreaks. I, it, I think it, it is likely, though, if the experts are right and Omicron is uh, going to go through really quickly and peak perhaps within a month and then come down after that, I think it's likely you will see uh, you know, lower hiring and and perhaps a pause in growth and that kind of thing. But but it it should be short lived. It should be, and then the economy, the forecast for the rest of the year, uh, or for certainly for the next quarter or two, would be a very positive one. Very positive. And if that happened, would, would that uh, increase the likelihood of Fed action to increase the funds, the federal funds rate, or would it delay that? If, sorry, if we if that if that all happens, I, so I, I think we're you know we're what we're seeing is an economy that that functions right through these waves of COVID, and I, I, I my colleagues and I see that, and uh, and you see that every quarter we write down projections of interest rates. They're individual projections. They're not a, they're not a, a committee plan or anything like that. But um, broadly speaking, all members of the committee see interest rate increases coming this year. The median was was three. Um, but that's going to depend on, on data. It's going to pe- depend on the progress we see on the supply side, the progress we see on inflation. Um, and, and we honestly don't know. There's risk on both sides, really, on growth uh, and, and, and potentially on inflation as well. So we're going to have to be uh, just very attentive to what's happening in the economy and willing to adapt uh, pretty nimbly our policy as we go through the year. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Senator Tester from Montana is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, I don't know if there's any way to turn that mic down, but that was almost painful. I mean, it was tough. Not your questions, Crapo, just the, the intensity. Uh, first of all, uh, Chairman Powell, I, w- I want to thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, I appreciate uh, your work that you've done uh, working with the Federal Reserve Board throughout the health and economic crisis that we found ourselves in. And uh, and just to say, as many have said before me, we appreciate your steady hand. Um, in your opening statement, you talked about climate change and, and cyber attacks, taking those into account as uh, as uh, as part of the things the Fed has to do. Uh, there was an interesting story in the Post yesterday that talked about $145 billion this country spent on disasters in 2021. December was the warmest ever. And last year was the fourth warmest year in history, um, and and I don't I think that's a conservative number because I don't think it took in the impacts uh, of of our crops and crop insurance and things like that. I say that because I hope you will continue to gather as much information as possible about what what needs to happen uh, as as this climate uh, situation appears to get, be getting worse and, and not better as time moves on. The American taxpayer deserves that. I. Um, Look, the, the challenges that we've had um, because of this pandemic, um, it's fair to say that the Federal Reserve has helped us get through this in a, in a major, major way. Um, this question has been asked before, so, but I'm going to ask it again in a different way. Could you, could you compare the economy pre-pandemic, pandemic a year ago, and today and tell me where we're at in relation to those three different points in time. Sure. So the, the pre-pandemic economy, that, that was a very long, historically long, 10 years and eight months uh, expansion. Growth was um, just modestly above potential 
every year. So we were getting growth between two and three percent, and we think potential growth is around two percent. So that that implies a tightening labor market. So we had this long, relatively uninterrupted um, period of growth, and what happened is unemployment kept coming down and participation kept coming up, and that was very beneficial. And you, you so you saw people around the edges of the of the uh, labor market getting more wages. We saw, we saw companies going to prisons and recruiting people who weren't going to get out for a couple of years. I mean, it was a very, very, it was a great labor market. So that's pre-pandemic. Um, so then the pandemic comes and it upends everything. Uh, and uh, so the question really is, what are things going to, how is it going to be different? And we're, we're only beginning to see that because we're not out of the pandemic. We're a long way from out of the pandemic potentially. But so what are some of the things that, that we're, we're seeing that are with us now? One of them is, is that uh, the recovery in labor force participation overall has been slower than hoped. Actually, prime age labor force participation has moved up a full percentage point almost last year. But overall, that was offset significantly by older people retiring, for people, older people and, and not older people retiring. So, so we're seeing some differences. We're also we're going to see people working remotely. Um, there's a um, the the wage increases that we're seeing are are still very skewed to the lower end of the income spectrum, so there may be something happening there where um, where uh, wages are just going to be higher for people, and I, 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 we don't know whether any of this will persist, but some of those those are some of the things that we're seeing. Um, I, I know employers who are hiring younger people out of school are finding that. They have to have one day to work from home, or they'll go to someplace else where they can get that. So it's a it's a place it's in a it's a market right now where labor is very short. And as a result, uh, workers have a, have a lot of leverage, and that may persist. So I think there's a lot of different things. Uh, I, I've just got a limited amount of time here, <laughs> but uh, could you speak a little bit about the importance of the independence of the Fed? Um, um, I remember pretty uh, clearly. Uh, the kind of pressure that was put on you by President Trump to try to politicize the Fed. Um, and I commend you on, on keeping it independent. Could you talk about why that's so important? Sure. So I, I, it's essential that we, we work for all Americans, and um, that's what we do. And it's essential that we do that without regard to political considerations like election cycles or um, particular political parties views on issues that are outside our mandate you know we, we we have to focus on the job Congress has given us which is maximum employment and price stability and also the payment system and financial stability and other things but we've got to do that and and that is the that is what we need to do to justify our continued independence and we're, we're committed to doing that thank you thank you mr. chairman Senator Tester Senator rounds from South Dakota is recognized thank you mr. chairman uh, Chairman Powell, first of all, uh, let me congratulate you again on being selected to serve a second term as the Chair of the Federal Reserve, and I do look forward to supporting your nomination. Um, I want to follow up a little bit with regard to the discussion on inflation. And it, consumer price index rose 6.8% in November. Uh, there appear, appears to be a consistency along that line. Part of that uh, you have the opportunity to impact with regard to the demand side. Can you talk to us about your discussions or at least your analysis of how much of the inflationary trends we're seeing you have the ability to impact with your monetary policy? So, we, again, we don't have much ability to affect the supply side. And if you look at where the really big contributors are to the overshoot from inflation, it's in the goods sector still largely, and that's cars, that's <clears throat> new used and rental cars, it's uh, appliances and... What about food? Goods. Food, too. Um, Hamburger at over $5 a pound? Yeah, no, and that's, see, that's not something we, we, we can't, I'd say that there are supply side issues there, too, as you and I have discussed, but those are really outside the, the range of our... Be fair to say, tools. petroleum products as well, um, yes. gas, price of gas at over $5. Yeah. A gallon. Those are items that, that are supply side. They are not uh, the demand side, and yet That's right. you have a, a responsibility to try to, or at least your goal is to remain inflation at about 2% or so. Right. But the supply side of this is a significant part of the entire inflationary demand. Fair to say that 
your focus is on the demand side, not the supply side, correct? That is right. That's correct. So what, what percent of that, that inflationary trend, what percent of that are you trying to impact with the demand side monetary policy that you have the ability to impact? I'd be hard to break it down in that way. I, I, would, I would say it this way, though. Right now, our policy is very highly accommodative, so we're stimulating. We're, we're not restraining demand at all at this point. We're encouraging it. We're trying to get to a place where we're more neutral and then perhaps tight, if, if that's appropriate. But it's, it, it, it's not political in nature. It is economic in nature to say that the inflationary trends that we are seeing are partially from the ability uh, of consumers with cash in their pockets to be able to pay a higher price. But second of all, it's because of the limitations and the bottlenecks that we find within the supply side of, of our economy, correct? Yes. So let's just take food as an example. I, I come from South Dakota where, where cows outnumber people, and yet we have producers there that on a regular basis talk about the fact that they don't see an increase in what they're receiving for livestock, and yet our consumers across the entire country are seeing huge increases in the price of meat. And in between them sit packers, four packers who control over 80% of the market, showing record high profits while consumers pay huge inflated prices. That's something which has to be dealt with with policy and not necessarily something that the Fed can impact, correct? That's really a competition policy policy question, yes. Yeah. So do we have the same type of challenges with regard to other items that people consume on a daily basis? And by that I mean petroleum products are something that I, I truly believe that the price rise in petroleum in 06, 07 uh, really impacted the ability of people to actually pay their mortgages or pay their rent or, uh, f for that matter, they were going to put food on the table before they were going to pay a mortgage. Do we have a similar type of situation developing here with regard to individuals that are trying to get to work, paying a higher price for their gasoline, uh, and now they're seeing the possibilities of other things going by the wayside? That is right. I mean, gas prices are high, and, and those gas prices and food prices are, and, and heating oil prices, uh, you know, are, th are the kind of things that affect people who are living paycheck to paycheck on a, on a fixed income. And not necessarily something that you can do at the Fed, but nonetheless, it does impact inflation, and it's something that would probably have to be addressed with the regulatory environment that we have within this country today. We can have marginal effects on demand, but we really, when it comes down to energy and food, it, those are those are largely uh, importantly influenced by supply side issues. Thank, thank you. And I, I would just add this: I, I, I know that with regard to regulations, uh, the Fed has been considering whether or not to make permanent adjustments on a separate item to the supplementary uh, leverage ratio or SLR in order to account for a significant influx of cash that consumers have got. They're trying to put them into banks, and yet banks have to, to basically have uh, capital uh, to be able to accept those deposits. I would just hope and I would consider that you uh, continue to look at considerations with regard to the adjustments on the SLR so that we actually have the ability to accept that, that, those, uh, those deposits in the future, sir. We, we will return to that. We, we, we want uh, risk-based capital to be binding, not the leverage ratio. We do want to make adjustments, but we want them to be done in ways that don't reduce the overall bindingness of the capital requirements on the largest firms. That's, that's an important principle. But within that, we do think there's some things we may be able to do on, on the SLR that, that honor that first principle. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Warner from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me, Chair Powell, let me join my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and thank you again for your service. Um, I'm going to pick up a little bit where my friend Senator Tester left off when he started talking about pre-pandemic economy, pandemic economy, and post-pandemic economy. You said in your testimony that the post-pandemic economy is likely to be different in some respects and that, quote, the uh, pursuit of the Fed's goals will need to take these differences into account. What are some of those differences? You mentioned we're seeing changes in employment patterns. We may need to see new supply chains. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit more about in that post-pandemic economy, um, what those differences will be, how it affects the Fed's decision making, and will there be actually any economic indicators that might be uh, have a new emphasis or, or even be new economic indicators in this post-pandemic economy? Hopefully, we, we get to. We, we're just beginning to see this sort of emerging from the fog, so it's all very indefinite. But you, you mentioned supply chains. Um, the supply chains we had pre-pandemic were very efficient and pretty fragile. And, and so I think companies, since the very beginning of the pandemic, have been looking at ways to have more robust um, supply chains that won't be you know, subject to these kind of disruptions that we've had now for two years. That's one. Another I mentioned earlier is labor force participation has been um, much slower to come back than we had hoped for. Um, the level of, of employment that's consistent with price stability is something that can evolve over time, and we have to deal with the economy as we find it. Right now, we have very high inflation and um, you know, wages at multi-decade highs, which are uh, not causing the current inflation at all, but something that we're watching. And we want participation to, to come back, but it's, it's been quite slow. We have to, we have to deal with the fact that it, it probably will take a long expansion to draw people back into the, to the, uh, uh, the labor market. Just to speak of two, there are many others. Well, for example, would child care be one of those factors? We still have a large percentage of the workforce, particularly women in the workforce's participation is still down. If we don't find a way to provide adequate, affordable child care, is that not going to be a long-term disruption? It's clearly weighing on participation still, although uh, participation has moved back up among women as well. But um, the, that part of the economy is, is suffering from a lack of workers as much as any part is, and so that, and that, that weighs on participation by people who depend on child care. Yes. I, I also think that on the supply chains, we, um, a lot of us at the beginnings of this, supply, uh, this pandemic raised concerns about being dependent on <clears throat> sole source, for example, whether it's the base chemicals that go into our pharmaceutical drugs or PPE coming from China. I think some of these changes are going to be permanent. We now at the Congress needs to act to make sure that uh, we don't maintain that dependence, but um, something I think we're going to need to continue to revisit. I want to come to another topic that you and I have talked about a long time. Out of the pandemic, we saw a disproportionate effect on minority communities. We lost 440,000 black-owned businesses. A lot of the delivery mechanisms that we put in place on the Paycheck Protection Program, well-intentioned, but clearly... Um, Minority-owned businesses didn't do as well. I'm a big believer, and I thank folks on both sides of the aisle. I want to particularly call out my friend Mike Crapo on this. We got a lot of money into the CDFIs and MDIs, um, but uh, there still remains challenges for these organizations. You, you know, for example, in light of after the murder of George Floyd, private sectors indicated they were going to put up about two hundred billion dollars to help deal with uh, racial wealth gap issues. But we continue to hear that there are a number of entities that might want to, for example, invest in MDIs, minority-owned depository institutions, with no intent of changing control, but they can't make those investments because of uh, uh, potentially triggering that regulation on change of control. I think we're going to need some regulatory review here. Uh, I think as well uh, we need to look at, um, for example, a, a non-emergency discount window that would be geared towards CDFIs and MDIs modeled after the, uh, the seasonal um, uh, discount windows that already exist on a non-emergency basis. Can you speak to um, uh, how you and, and the Fed can work with me and others on this committee to make sure that CDFIs and MDIs um, that are going to continue to play, I think, an increasingly important role in serving underserved communities don't get blocked by some of these regulatory barriers? Yes, yeah, so we... As we and we've we talked about this a lot, we're we're very focused on what we can do to support CDFIs and MDIs. We did see uh, in in the in the recovery from the pandemic, uh, in a number of cases where they were the they were the ones who were there in in poor communities delivering credit and uh, to the extent to a great extent. So they were they were in some cases pretty effective. Nonetheless, so we, what what are we doing? As you as you know, under under ESIP, where we've been. Um, working with the other banking agencies to make sure that those loans and, and investments can be made in a way that, that, is, that gives attractive capital uh, treatment. Um, and, and I, you know, there's a range of things that we're doing. We, we, we do want to foster investment in CDFIs and MDIs under the law. 
And well, um, I would just ask okay. to, that we um, we can continue this offline. But you know, for those ent entities and private capital that wants to come into these institutions with no intention of trying to take over control, whether we set up a different class of stock or some ability for the private capital to flow into these without triggering the change of control requirements that, frankly, at this point prevents a lot of those investments. So I appreciate what you've, we've worked on so far, but much more to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Warner. Uh, Senator Tillis is from North Carolina, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair Powell, thank you for being here. Uh, you mentioned in your opening statement you committed to regular and uh, frequent contact. I can attest to the fact that you have regularly contacted my office, and anytime we've had a request for a conversation, you've been very prompt, so I appreciate you for your responsiveness. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, current extraordinary inflationary pressures and the tools that the Fed has to deal with it. The, uh, of course, you could have a benchmark rate increase. We know what that would have as a consequence for raising the price of lending and, and ultimately affecting the cost of buying a car or buying a house or just making ends meet. Your, your other option is to reduce the balance sheet, um, uh, particularly from some of the COVID area bond buying programs. I believe that it was Governor Waller who just last month said that uh, because of the alarming rate of inflation, the Fed should begin shrinking the asset portfolio without delay. And I think this week, the uh, Fed president uh, from Atlanta, uh, Mr. Bostic, said he thinks the Fed should aggressively draw down the balance sheet by at least $100 billion a month. I know you went up from $15 billion to $30 billion, uh, but that's a three-and-a-half time increase over the current uh, run rate. So to what extent do you think... Um, and, and give me an idea of discussions that you're having at the Fed to uh, have a, a faster taper in lieu of a rate increase. We haven't made any decisions. We had our first uh, discussion of these issues about runoff. Uh, and as you mentioned, there are a number of different pieces to talk about. We had that at the December meeting. I expect we'll talk about it again at the January meeting. Um, and uh, again, just no decisions. But I, as we reflected in our minutes, we looked at what the Fed did last time, and I was there as we, as we uh, you know, uh, ended QE and then, and then later started to have the balance sheet shrink. And we thought that's, we, we looked at that, uh, that experience and thought that's quite informative, but the economy's in a completely different place than it was uh, when we ended asset purchases the last time. So the period of time between stopping purchases and beginning runoff will be shorter. And also, the balance sheet's much bigger, and so <clears throat> it can be the runoff can be uh, can be faster. So I would say sooner and faster. That's that much is clear. Beyond that, we're not at a point of making decisions at this point. We'll have another discussion, and I think we we will be in a position to provide guidance at coming meetings. But um, and you know, we're mindful that the balance sheet is nine trillion dollars. It's far above where it needs to be. And, um, and it's at, the, at the current drawdown rate, that's about a 24-year trajectory to retire the balance sheet. Is that right? It would depend on the speed, you assume. Yeah. Um, uh, what but, sort of uh, indicators are you looking at that would actually drive you to, uh, uh, to a, a faster taper, particularly based on some of the comments of the folks at the Fed? You know, we're, we're looking at the whole range of things. So th this balance sheet is much shorter in duration than, than the one that we, uh, that we had at the end of the global financial crisis. That can play into it. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll do, we tend to do a lot of analysis. We tend to take two, three, four meetings to, to work these things through. I find that the best ideas sometimes take a while to surface. They did the last time on, on this, on this issue. So, um, it'll be part of the thing, the things that we're discussing and doing this year. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I, I should have also mentioned that I look forward to supporting your nomination. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to bank mergers. You know, Senate Bill 2155 <clears throat> gave us the opportunity to do some regulatory tailoring for some of the uh, smaller banks, and I think it was largely successful. Appreciate the bipartisan effort to do it. But I still, you know, bank mergers are one of the most highly regulated transactions um, that uh, you could go through. It involves the federal regulators, including the Fed, the Department of Justice, and a lot of opportunities for outside interest groups and others to voice their opinions. But I'm getting the sense that moving forward, um, there may be a, a, a trend towards making it more difficult for some of the super regionals and other banks to move through the 
merger process. I tracked one recently that involved a North Carolina banking institution that seemed to take a bit longer than I thought it would have. Um, so can you give me an assurance that there isn't a sort of increasing bias on the part of the federal regulators to make it more difficult for some of these super regional and smaller banks to actually get through a merger and acquisition process? Or is there, am I missing, um, uh, is this a trend that I should be concerned with, or do you believe that federal or the financial regulators are still in a position to allow that ecosystem to continue to evolve, which I personally believe is very important for the viability of the U.S. banking system? So we're, we're still applying the same. The law hasn't changed, and our practices haven't changed. We're still working our way through um, you know, the applications that we have in front of us. Okay, and I'll submit a, co a question for the record on the status of uh, the uh, Fed payment system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Warren from Massachusetts is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So since President Biden took office, we've added more than 6.4 million jobs, the most jobs that have ever been added to the economy in U.S. history. But over the past few months, families have faced higher prices at the grocery store, at the gas pump. Addressing inflation is one of the Federal Reserve's most important jobs, and if we're going to solve this problem, then we need to understand why it's happening. So if we can, let's start with Econ 101. Chair Powell, in markets with lots of competitors, are companies' profit margins generally likely to stay low? That is, in competitive markets, are profit margins likely to stay steady, modestly above the cost of labor, or materials, and capital? I mean, microeconomics would tell you that all other things equal, you, you know, you'll compete down to your marginal cost. Good. And in markets with greater concentration and not much competition, are corporations generally able to raise prices and increase profit margins, all else being equal? So the connection, actually, the connection between concentration and market power is not as clean as we might think it might be. In some of the industries that have uh, have concentrated, they've, they've actually um, there actually has been you know sort of lower cost increases. It's resulted in in lower cost to consumers, and I'm thinking there of retail and things like that. So it's not as direct. Well, but let me ask it the other way then, because we're still kind of doing Econ 101 here. If you're a corporation that has eaten up most of the competition and cornered the market, is it easier for you to raise prices on your customers and maximize your profits? Because you don't have to worry about losing your business. In other words, that's you've lost the, the discipline that the market imposes. In principle, if you don't have competition and you're a monopolist, yes, you can raise your prices. Okay, and over the past year... We know that prices have risen because of supply chain problems, unexpected shifts in the demand for goods, and even higher labor costs. But if corporations were simply passing along these costs in highly competitive markets, would the company's profit margins have changed much? You know, so many things affect, affect those, uh, that calculation. I, but it, in principle, you could be right, but... Uh, well, it's very much not what we're seeing right now. Today, nearly two out of three of the biggest publicly traded corporations in the country are reporting fatter profit margins than they reported before the pandemic, which doesn't sound like they're just passing along costs. So, so let me ask you, does that increase in profit margins combined with greater market concentration in industry after industry – suggest to you that some corporations may be passing along increased costs and, at the same time, charging more on top of that to fatten their profit margins. That, that could be right. It could also just be, though, that demand is incredibly strong and, and that, um, you know, they're, they're raising prices because they can. Well, that's the point. They're raising prices because they can, and they're not being competed down. You know, market concentration has allowed giant corporations to hide behind claims of increased costs to fatten their profit margins. So the consumer pays more both because the corporation faces higher costs and because, as you put it, because the corporation can increase prices. The reason I raise this is that higher prices have many causes 
And we can't overlook the role that concentrated corporate power has played in creating the conditions for price gouging. Now, before my time expires, I want to ask you about one other important topic, and that is about climate change. Mr. Chair, when you came before the Banking and Housing Committee last July, you said that the transition to a lower carbon economy could, quote, lead to a sudden repricing of assets or entire industries, and that we need to be in a position to deal with all of that. Why is it important for the Fed to assess risks related to climate change in order to fulfill its mandate? So our, our role on climate change is, is a limited one, but it's an important one, and it is to assure that the banking institutions that we regulate understand their risks and can manage them. And it's also to look after financial stability. And with financial stability, the, the issue really is, can something from climate change arise to the level that would threaten the st stability of the entire financial system? So that sounds like more in the, in the nature of, of uh, what you were reading, something in the nation of transition risk, where some unexpected corp, you know, government policy uh, change happens, which, which, which could potentially create disruption. Oh. Well, the world is running out of time to deal with the climate crisis, and the Fed has an important role to play here, and I hope the Fed will step up. Last thing, Chair Powell, I sent you another letter asking for more information about the Fed's ethics scandal, and I asked for a response by next Monday. Can I receive your assurance that I'll get that response by next Monday? I'll have to look into the status of that. You'll get either a response or we'll update you on where we are. Okay. I'd like to have a response. Okay. Very important. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Chairman. Kennedy of Louisiana is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, congratulations. I think it's fair to say that uh, you are, and once you're confirmed, will continue to be one of the most powerful people in the world. Um, so I want to begin today. I have some questions, but first, I have a plea. Um, ab above all else, above everything else on your plate, I ask that you please preserve the independence of the Federal Reserve. The last thing that America needs right now is to have the Federal Reserve politicized. It's the last thing the world needs right now. And believe me, the whole world is watching, and, uh, including our enemies. Now, I, I get it. Our politics is polarized. I hope you'll remain um, blissfully ignorant of that. And I'll, I, I get it. I'm not telling you not to listen to elected officials, public officials. Um, I, I, I get it. I mean, I can only speak for the Senate. We have some very smart people in the Senate. They have strong opinions and strong personalities. Uh, we've got a few senators that, uh, to paraphrase Dave Barry, think they ought to make a Hamilton-style musical about their lives. I get all that. Um, but you've got to remain independent. The dollar and political fads come and go, but the dollar doesn't. I hope not. The dollar underpins the entire world economy. Politicize it at your own risk. Let me shift gears. Question. Uh, Professor Keynes, about whom I, I know you know more than I do, but Professor Keynes has seen a resurgence um, 
in the last few decades. In, uh, in his uh, number of followers. And of course, we both know, Professor Kane said, one way to get out of a recession is to have the government spend money it doesn't have to deficit spend, to stimulate the economy. But Professor Kane said something else that the media doesn't usually quote. He also said, when you get out of the recession, pay the damn money back, didn't he? Didn't he say that? Yeah, I was going to I was going to add that. It was he's, what he said was you should be, it's OK to do deficit spending, but you should be doing surplus, uh, you know, in good times to, to sort yeah. of keep it. Yeah. Now, behind me is a is a chart. Of our public debt going all the way back to, I think, 1990. You don't have to be Euclid to see that the direction is up. And it's been up under Republican administrations, and it's been up under Democratic administrations. It's been up under Democratic and Republican Senates and, house, and, and, and houses. It's up. So here's my question to you. At what point, how much is, is too much? At what point, in your judgment, are we going to hit the point where you have to say, no, that's it. We can't do anymore. It's hurting the world. It's hurting our country. So we, we don't know when that is. Um, and as the world's reserve currency, demand for our paper is, is very strong. Uh, if, if, you, if you had shown that and then asked somebody 15 years ago to predict what interest rates would be, they wouldn't be predicting that the, that the 10 year would be at 175. No. Right? So it, there just, there'd been a lot of demand. But they would have predicted that the debt was going to go up. They, they, with, they would have looked at that picture and said, well, you must be experiencing difficulty borrowing, but we're not at all. So, no, we're on an unsustainable path. Debt is not at an unsustainable level, but the path is unsustainable, meaning it's growing faster than the economy meaningfully faster than the economy. We have to address that over time. We will address it over time. And the better way to do it is soon and to do it in good times. Start when the economy is strong and the taxes are rolling in. And that's, that's you know, I, since we don't do fiscal policy, but I will say that the sustainability of the debt is, uh, is something we need to get back to and focus on again. Good luck, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we all recognize we've got continuing economic challenges, uh, but I think it's important uh, to look at some critical areas where we're much better off today than the Fed predicted what it would be uh, at this time uh, just a little uh, while ago. Um, we've seen a record increase of 6.4 million jobs uh, in our economy uh, in 2021. And back in December of 2020, uh, when the unemployment rate was 6.7%, uh, the Federal Board of Governors projected that the unemployment rate in December of the year we just came out of uh, would be 5%. Isn't that correct? I'm sure. If, I, I can't do it from memory, but I'm sure you're right. All right. Well, as I reviewed the, your predictions, that was what it was. And in fact, um, we did much better than that. Uh, the unemployment uh, rate for December, uh, the month that we just uh, left, uh, was 3.9 percent, and the unemployment rate for that fourth quarter of last year was 4.2 uh, percent, a year ahead of what the Fed had predicted. Is that right? Yes. And what happened in between was um, a lot of us here in the Senate and the House and folks around the country uh, looked at those projections and said, that is not the kind of course we want to be on. And we passed the American Rescue Plan, uh, which helped stabilize the economy and helped result in those much improved employment numbers. Isn't that right? Yes. Uh, now, let me just talk about inflation. I think all of us recognize that uh, Americans are experiencing uh, price increases in, in many areas. Uh, the Federal Reserve has predicted a, well, the Cleveland Fed it, it projected a 2.6 percent inflation rate for this year, which matches the Federal Reserve Board's uh, projections. If you look at consumer expectations, um, not surprisingly, they're running higher than that because of where we've been in the last couple months. 
but can you explain why you're confident at the Federal Reserve uh, that we can hit that uh, 2.6 percent uh, target while continuing to push for full employment? So that, that is the median of expectations, of individual expectations. We don't have a committee or official Fed forecast. Um, so, and it's conditioned on a number of assumptions. And you know, the, the, the most important assumption here is that we do get significant relief on the supply side, that global supply chains loosen up and we get you know, more semiconductors so that we can start manufacturing cars again. That's, that's essentially, the, that's going to be a big part of getting inflation back down. Part of it will also be our, our moving from a very highly accommodative policy to a somewhat less accommodative policy, but still accommodative. But a lot of it will come on the supply side. Right. And on the supply chain issue, uh, I mean, there have been recent reports of <clears throat> progress in a number of uh, supply chain <clears throat> bottlenecks. Can you just speak to your uh, perception of where that stands? Yeah, so I, I, it's just, it's, you see, you've, all, you've always see a few snowflakes, but it doesn't amount to a storm yet. Um, you're, if you look at, uh, look at the Port of Los Angeles, Port of uh, Long Beach, record numbers of ships still at anchor. We did see, and this may be what, you're, what, you, what you saw, that uh, in, inventories are moving up and delivery times have shortened, and that, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, uh, you know, Omicron can really... Um, particularly if China sticks to a, to a no-COVID policy, Omicron can, can really disturb the supply chains again, although it could be briefer this time. So I think the picture is, you know, we're, it, it, we wouldn't want to say, I wouldn't want to say that we, it's decisively improving yet, but we're, we're watching it carefully. I got it. I, I was pleased to hear uh, President <clears throat> Biden say when uh, he renominated you uh, for this position um, that uh, making that you you saw the economic risks of climate change as a quote top priority um, is, is that an accurate statement? Yes. And if confirmed, how do you plan to prioritize addressing the financial risks of climate change in your next term? So we have a role to play. It's a narrow one, but an important one, and that is it relates to our existing mandates. We don't have a new mandate on climate change. It is really the simple mandate, uh, the central mandate of of um, supervising and regulating financial institutions to make sure that they're aware of and able to manage all of their risks. And we're doing that, particularly focusing on the largest financial institutions who, by the way, are spending a lot of time themselves on these issues. Uh, and secondly, looking at, at financial stability issues. You know, we have um, uh, responsibility for the f stability of the financial system, and over time, climate risk can, can play into that as well. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, you, you do agree that it's a, a top priority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, Senator Van Hans. Senator Haggerty from uh, Tennessee is ranking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Toomey. I appreciate your holding this hearing. And I want to congratulate Chairman Powell on being renominated to be the chair of the Fed. Thank you for your testimony and your presence here today, Chairman. First, I have just a quick housekeeping question for you. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but as a matter of, of fact, are, have you ever embellished your resume, your record, your publication history? I don't think so. I did not think so. Thank you <laughs> for clarifying that for us. Um, I'd like to turn to the topic of quantitative easing for just a minute, Chairman Powell. When Chairman Bernanke <clears throat> first introduced quantitative easing back in 2009, he assured lawmakers at that point <clears throat> that it would be both <clears throat> temporary and rare. <clears throat> Essentially, it was introduced as an emergency measure. Do you agree that it should be, that quantitative easing should be both temporary and rare? Well, I, I agree we shouldn't use it unless we need to, but I, I will say it's going to depend to some extent on where interest rates are. We've been in a very low interest rate environment even during good times all over the world, and when that's the case, we don't have a lot of ammunition to support the economy. So I can imagine a, a regular garden variety downturn, which we haven't had in a long time, um, in which we didn't need to resort to uh, quantitative easing to asset purchases, and, and we then wouldn't. But um, in a world where you've only got a couple hundred basis points to cut, you may need to do that, because what that gives you is the ability to, to move longer run rates down, not just at the short end. I, I, I understand, but I, I just remain concerned, because here we are 12 years later from its first introduction. The Fed's balance sheet's nearly $9 trillion. We're continuing to grow it, albeit at a slower pace. So um, it, it remains a real concern. You, you said earlier to Senator Shelby 
that you think the Fed could begin the process of normalizing its balance sheet later this year. Can you provide us with a little bit more clarity on this process, um, how soon you think this would begin, and whether you'd, active, whether you'd consider actively selling securities rather than just letting them gradually run off the balance sheet? So this, this is a uh, – we, we uh, had our first discussion of this, this set of issues at the December FOMC meeting. We'll talk about it again at the, at the January meeting in a couple of weeks. Haven't made any decisions. This time is going to bear some similarity to what we did last time, but it's going to be different too, and that, that's already clear in that we will have the ability to move sooner and to move a little faster than we did uh, uh, last time. So more clarity is coming you know, soon on that, but I, I don't want to get ahead of the committee. In terms of selling assets, we haven't made any decisions on that. We didn't do that last time. Um, we never ruled it out either. Mm -hmm. So it's just something we'll be looking at. The balance sheet's a whole lot bigger this time, and also the duration is shorter. So it's, it's a different, and the economy's much stronger. Yeah. So it's a, it's a uh, very different situation. So I'd like to come to the question of governance, if I might. Um, while you've been nominated to remain chairman of the Fed, the Biden administration's three proposed <clears throat> appointees would, together with the nominee for vice chairman, who, who we will hear from this Thursday, constitute a majority of the Federal Reserve Board. Looking recently at the five-member board at the FDIC and what happened there. There at the FDIC, a five-member board overturned 88 years of tradition and independence with Biden political appointees led by CFPB Director Rohit, <clears throat> excuse me, Rohit Chopra forcing out the FDIC chairman before her five-year term was up, strictly for partisan reasons. This incident causes me to worry that an activist block at the Federal Reserve Board could sideline you they could exert their authority while excluding the full FOMC membership. So my question for you, Mr. Chairman, is the Fed vulnerable to similar unfortunate politically motivated hijacking of an organization like we just witnessed at the FDIC, and what could this committee do to prevent it? First, I, I, um, and you'll know that I, I don't have any comment at all on the recent events at the FDIC. So at the Fed, um, regulatory monetary policy is conducted by the Federal Open Market Committee, which includes the 12 Reserve Bank presidents. And, sorry, and, and, and in total, there are uh, tw as many as 12 voters. Yeah. So um, we'll always have a balance of governors and, and Reserve Bank presidents. Regulatory policy is really the bus business of the Board of Governors, and we, there, there are as many as seven governors and a majority is four. We do have a history at the Fed of working collaboratively and, and um, coming together and, and getting consensus on issues, and I would hope that that, that certainly is my intention, that is my nature, and um, I, I will work hard to make sure that, that, uh, that things stay that way. And as a member of this committee, I'll work hard to support you in that, uh, to, to, to maintain that posture as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Harry. Senator uh, uh, Cortez Mastow from Nevada is recognized from her office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, it's good to see you again. Thank you always for taking the time uh, to uh, answer my calls, meet with me, answer my questions. So appreciate it. Um, I, I, let me start. Uh, with a question that Senator Tester um, talked to you about, because I think it's important uh, we recognize, put this in perspective again. He asked you about the comments about what the economy was like pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and then after. And you actually said something I think was important, that we are still in a pandemic. And even still in the middle of this pandemic, uh, you said earlier in your opening remarks that the economy is expanding at its fastest pace in many years and the labor market is strong. Now in our many conversations, uh, you have always prioritized job growth and higher wages, especially for those who tend to earn lower salaries. And you have consistently said that the best thing any one of us can do to increase employment, wage, raise wages, uh, improve our supply chains and reduce inflation is to get vaccinated, to wear masks and follow the medical guidance to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Do you still believe that reducing COVID-19 infections will have the greatest impact on inflation, supply chains, employment participation and wages? I do, and, and I think if you imagine a world in which we no longer have to deal with a pandemic, and that would, that, I think that's the answer to your question. We would quickly see the supply side problems alleviate. We'd probably see significantly more labor supply. 
So these issues are, are still related to the pandemic. It's proving more difficult than we had hoped to, to end the pandemic, but uh, I certainly would think that's right. And l let me just add one additional thing that, uh, I, of course, we all have concerns with the rising prices of, of so many goods. I see it in, <clears throat> in my home state when I go grocery shopping or hear it from my only family members and constituents in Nevada. One other area I, I wanna also focus on though is housing. A new study from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Atlanta reported that the median American household would need 32% of its income to cover mortgage payments on a median priced home. Uh, the most since November 2008 and home prices have climbed 18% in the past year. Now, we are short at least 3 million homes, especially affordable homes. Uh, so, Chairman Powell, do you think increasing the supply of housing, in, in essence building more homes, would also have an effect on the inflationary prices that we're seeing right now in the housing market? Yes, and that's outside of what we can do, but but clearly um, mm -hmm. the housing market's extremely tight. It was tight before the pandemic, and it's it's remarkably tight now, and supply is quite limited. Thank you. Let me jump to uh, another topic, which is um, ethics um, for the Board of Directors. I think we're all disappointed uh, that uh, Vice Chair Clarita did not disclose his act of trading uh, in late February 2020. Um, you and I have had this conversation. Uh, can you describe the changes you've made to improve the ethics guidelines and training at the Federal Reserve? Yes, I'd, I'd be glad to. So we've really made a complete change in, in um, the way we govern um, purchases and sales of securities by covered people, which includes all of the policymakers and senior staffers. Um, we could, no one can any longer buy individual stocks. In addition, um, if you want to sell something that you, so people will be owning mutual funds mainly, um, as I already do. Um, when you want to sell something, um, it has to be outside of blackout as always, but you've got to give 45 days notice and you make that decision. You've got to clear that trade with a, with that sale with a central body. We don't really have, because of our federated nature, we don't have a group in the center that applies these rules consistently and, and clearly across the whole system. We will have that now at the Board of Governors. So you'll go and you'll say, I want to sell X amount of, of this mutual fund. 45 days later, that trade will, will take place, whether things change or not. So there will be no ability to time the market and, and really no appearance of um, the, the kind of appearance issues that we've had. Uh, I think the old system was in place for decades on end and then suddenly it was revealed as insufficient. And so we do take the need to protect our credibility with the public very seriously. And I think our new system is easily the toughest in government and the toughest I've seen anywhere. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Senator Lummis from Wyoming is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations on your uh, nomination. Um, please throw me a lifeline here and help me support your nomination. Um, the, federal's, the Fed's website today says that the Federal Reserve will ensure the provision of payment services to all depository institutions on an equitable basis and to do so in an atmosphere of competitive fairness. But that's not the case at all, Mr. Chairman. The Fed actually uses substantial discretion in providing master accounts to depository institutions or denies them by delay, simply starving the master account applicant until it dies. And that's true even though every single federal court that has ever looked at this issue disagrees with the Fed's assertion of substantial discretion. <clears throat> the Greater Buffalo Press and Jet Courier Services cases in the Second and Sixth Circuits found that the Federal Reserve Services were, quote, available to all banks the fourth corner credit union case in the 10th circuit 
from 2017 said the same thing. The Federal Reserve Act says that a depository institution is any institution eligible for deposit insurance. The FDIC says in General Counsel Opinion 8867 that an entity is a depository institution if it is creating deposit liabilities out of customer assets and is characterized by state law as a bank. As you know, Chairman Powell, I'm terribly concerned about the manner in which Wyoming's special purpose depository institutions are being treated by the Federal Reserve. We've discussed this. Um, what is your reaction to this? So, uh, as, as we discussed, um, there are novel charters, and the SPDIs are, are, are one of them, and we want to be really careful because they're, they're hugely precedential. They're very important from a precedential standpoint. And so we've been looking carefully at this, uh, and I, I would say there are, there are good arguments for, for viewing SPDIs as depository institutions for this purpose, and I think we are, you know, we're looking carefully at it. I, I do think we'll make some progress on this, and um, we can talk about it more offline. But um, it's, it, you should, I think you do understand that we, you know, we, it, we, we start granting these. There'll be a couple hundred of them pretty quickly, and we have to think about the broader safety and soundness uh, implica implications. And, you know, it's, it, it's just hugely precedential. That's really why we've taken our time with it. And, um, we appreciate your uh, bringing it to my attention, and, uh, and um, so we can continue to talk about it. Well, as you know, it's been well over a year, well over a year. And uh, it's, I, I've been stonewalled for well over a year. My state has been stonewalled for well over a year. You know, you mentioned in your testimony today that we can begin to see that the post-pandemic economy is likely to be different in some respects. My job is to represent Wyoming's best interests and to ensure the Fed is preparing itself for the post-pandemic economy and to promote responsible innovation, as you mentioned in your statement. You know, I asked your staff for an update on the SPDI charter last week, and I've yet to receive a response. And as we discussed in December, I believed I would receive a response um, by today. So um, my disappointment is profound. My frustration is profound. And for now, I'll just leave it at that. But I will say thank you for your uh, dialogue with Senator Kennedy and Senator Haggerty today. I thought those were in encouraging uh, dialogues. And uh, once again, Sen Chairman Powell, throw me a lifeline. I yield back. Thanks, Senator Lama. Senator Smith of Minnesota is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown and Ranking Member Toomey, and uh, welcome <clears> to the <throat> committee again. Uh, Chair Powell, it was, um, as always, it was good to talk with you yesterday, and I want to just say, um, Mr. Chair, that I think that uh, uh, together, uh, Chair Powell and um, um, Lael Brainerd, um, will make a, would make a great team at the Fed, and I, I, think, you're a, I think you're a strong combination. Um, so, Mr. Chair Powell, I'd like to ask you about um, kind of in, where we are with employment and how this relates to the decisions that the Fed, um, uh, Fed's, Fed is making. Last week, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released job numbers from December, as you know well, and thanks to the American Rescue Plan, and I would also say the hard work and grit and innovation of Americans, the unemployment rate has dropped to just 3.9%, which is really a remarkable and historic recovery from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I'd note that in my home state of Minnesota in November, the unemployment rate was even lower. Um, so uh, this, is, um, this is really an incredible accomplishment. Um, and you and I have discussed this before, how it is useful to unbundle, though, these aggregate numbers so that we understand um, 
um, a little bit more about what's happening, we understand that it's a more complicated story. For example, black workers, amongst black workers, the unemployment rate remains stubbornly high at 7.1%, more than twice what it is for white workers. So, uh, Chair Pell, could you um, tell us, how should the Fed consider factors like this as you evaluate economic strength and whether the economy has reached full employment? This, how, the factors, what I'm referring to as unbundling um, these aggregate numbers, so we understand more deeply what impact um, where we are with the different sectors of our economy. Sure. So we we do look at a wide range of indicators to determine whether we're whether labor market conditions broadly are consistent with maximum employment. It's not a single number like inflation can be, and you mentioned a couple of them. So. Um, what we saw at the end of the last very long expansion was that unemployment rates and the gap between white unemployment rates and, and other unemployment rates were, were at all-time lows. And this was a very desirable feature, and, and really a feature of having a tight labor market. So that's something that, that, that's a little bit of, a, of something that tells us whether the labor market is tight. We're not targeting a particular number there, but we're using it to inform our thinking. You mentioned African-American uh, unemployment, which is at 7.1. It dropped by 2.9 percent this year. Um, that's the same decline as for white workers. The other thing I'll say is that there was an increase in December of, of five or six tenths among black, uh, in black unemployment. It's a much smaller sample size, and it's pretty volatile, so we would tend to look for a couple of months. It can bounce around more than the, than the overall aggregate. Another key aspect of maximum employment, though, is participation. So we, want to, we also want to think that participation is at its structural high level, and, and there isn't a lot of slack in that, in, in that pocket. And that's been, um, we saw that at the end of the last uh, cycle. We saw a lot, we saw participation holding up in the face of demographic decline. And so that's another thing that we look at carefully. Yeah, thank you. I agree with that. And I think that um, we are in Minnesota, as, as we are all over the country, experiencing a shortage of workers. And I'm glad mm -hmm. to see that what we are seeing, in fact, is wages increasing. Um, especially for people um, who are um, in lower wage jobs, and that for the first time in a long time, workers I think have increased bargaining power, which is um, which is a benefit to them. Uh, so these are complicated um, issues. I think it's important that we kind of look beneath some of these aggregate numbers. But I just I want to touch on another issue before I um, wrap up here. Um, you and I have talked about my grandmother, Avis Mason, who. Um, was born in 1898 and who became the president of a small community bank in Etna Green, Indiana. Her father, who started the bank, was blessed with three daughters, which is how she became president. Um, um, like so many banks around the country and over the years, her bank was ultimately sold to a larger bank um, and became part of the story of increased consolidation in the financial sector. And this pattern has repeated itself for decades in Minnesota and all across the country. Um, over the last 30 years, the number of banks in this country has been more than cut in half. Um, and we've seen, I think, the harm that industry consolidation can do broadly, um, especially in small towns and rural places. I note the comments and the questions of my colleague, Senator Rounds, with whom I've done a lot of work on issues of concentration in agriculture. So, Chair Pell, one of the <clears throat> important duties of the Fed is to review bank mergers. Can you Tell us how you think about bank mergers today, and what do you see as the, the impacts of consolidation on concentration and access to financial services, especially in underserved areas? So we operate under a, a statute which requires us to consider a number of factors, and I, it, those include competition and future prospects, financial and managerial resources, convenience and needs of the communities to be served, CRA performance, BSA AML compliance, and financial stability. So the, all of those things go into our, and there's a, there's a rich lore of how we apply those things. And, and generally, banks that are applying for permission to do mergers understand that, that body of, uh, of work. Um, more broadly, though, as, as we've discussed, the, if you, you could look back at, at the, the United States banking industry, it's a, for 30 years and more, almost 40 years, you've seen a very steady decline in the number of banks. So one of the things that's driving that is just, you know, the loss of rural population. And we, I, I've seen many, uh, in my earlier years at the Fed, many cases in which you'd have a, um, a, a, a county that had lost half of its population over the last 50 years. It's very typical of rural America. And there, were, there was only one bank left, and it wanted to merge with, with, the only, with another bank in a nearby 
uh, nearby states. So anyway, it's, um, it's a trend that's happening because of demographic changes. Also, fixed costs are going up. Regulatory costs are going up, and that's a fixed cost. The need to invest in technology to serve your customers is, is really a fixed cost now, and that, that requires a bigger bank. So I, I do, we're, we, you know, community banks are part of the fabric of America, and we, we don't want anything we do to sort of exacerbate the problem of community banks going out of business, but there are strong secular forces that are driving this consolidation apart from, you know, regulation, although that can be part of it. Thank you. I believe I'm out of town. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Chair. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Kramer from North Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey. Thank you, uh, Chairman Powell, for uh, stepping up again and being willing to take the job on. Congratulations. I'm going to go back to a, a question somebody asked probably an hour and a half ago. A very high-level uh, point that the person, that one of my colleagues made, and I don't remember which one, but he said in congratulating you that President Biden clearly has confidence in your ability to lead our economy through this crisis. And um, without judging those particular words, I'd ask you flat out, do you lead our economy? Is that what your job is to do, is to lead the economy? I, I, I'm uh, responsible for an agency that has, that has specific narrow mandates. I wouldn't want to characterize it uh, one way or the other. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't either, quite honestly. But um, <laughs> I have great, great respect for and confidence in our free market economy with a very light regulatory touch. Um, that said, I also want to associate myself with Senator Kennedy's strong word of encouragement to keep the Fed independent. That is why I respect you so much. Uh, Chairman Paul, is in, uh, under the previous president, you, you maintained independence, and we would certainly hope and expect that you'd continue that independence under the current uh, administration. I want to, you've, you've touched on this, uh, but I want just a little further clarification, because somebody, I think it was Senator Menendez, asked you, uh, how, how do you balance the two mandates, <clears throat> of course, price stability and a maximum uh, employment? I thought you did a pretty good job, but I want to give you a chance to make it even clearer. And maybe I'll help with the way I form the question. Doesn't price stability naturally lead to a strong economy, which naturally leads to to a maximum employment? In, in other words, you talked, I think, in your answer that you know we focus on whichever ones in the needs the help the most at a given time. That's my paraphrase of it. But perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit on. Sure. That. So most of the time, most of the time, monetary policy works the same way for both of them. You know, usually inflation is low when, you know, when the economy is weak, when, when unemployment is high. And so you, you cut interest rates and that, that, that helps unemployment go down and helps inflation move up, back up to 2%. So usually that's the case, almost all the time. In rare occasions, though, you have a situation where, where, the, where the two sort of goals are not complementary. And we, we have, we've had a little bit of that here. I'm not sure we have it anymore, but the idea being that we were far from maximum employment. That, that's no longer the case, but inflation was really high. So um, uh, it, I think the situation today is more correctly characterized as we're very rapidly approaching or at maximum employment, and we're far away from our inflation tool. There's no basis to prefer one of the two goals over the other, but our, our form, you know, our, our constitutionally adopted document at the Fed, our statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy, says when this is the case, we, we look how far something is from the goal and how long it'll take to get to the goal. And we look at the other goal and, and we use our tools. And I think in the current, the current application of that provision would say you, you need to focus on getting inflation under control because you're not going to have maximum employment unless you have price stability. I agree. Thank you. Well said. Um, in fact, with that in mind, I, what I worry the most about with the Fed, um, and you and I have discussed this previously, is the mission creep that I think both clouds and, frankly, complicates that main mission of price stability. If you're having to sit around and you have to hire people that are going to assess climate risk, as an example, as though banks themselves aren't already considering that, which, by the way, climate risk, in my mind, is really regulatory risk. Um, because climate is a global issue. It's not a domestic issue. Uh, it, it's a domestic issue to the degree it's a, a global issue. But what I worry about is the natural outcome of further regulations in the climate sphere, 
and that's what we're talking about with the climate stress test um, or cyber stress test or any, any other number of, of tests, but climate in particular. The natural outcome is that we're going to tr somehow transfer our climate guilt to other countries who don't have our environmental and labor standards. In other words, we don't do anything to help the climate except, um, except to have more imports from, uh, from faraway places that are much larger polluters than ours. So I, I have to tell you, I'm a little worried. I'm quite worried, actually, mostly worried about the mission creep at the Fed should we continue to add these extra things that you have to be focused on. And I would just ask for uh, a response to that, and then my time will wrap up. Well, I, I, I agree with your principle, that, which is that we've got to stick to our knitting if, we want to, knitting if we want to remain independent. I really do. And, uh, you know, I guess I would say climate is appropriate for us as an issue to the extent it fits within our existing mandates. And, and I think it does, uh, you know, in the sense of it's another risk over time that banks are going to run. And, but we're, we're not, you know, we're not, the broader answer to climate change has to come from legislators and, um, and the private sector. I agree. Thank you, and I look forward to supporting your confirmation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ossoff is recognized from his office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chair Powell, for joining us. Congratulations on <clears throat> your renomination. Chair Powell, are you prepared, if necessary, to act with agility, flexibility, and speed uh, if inflation risk to the upside manifests in the coming months and quarters? Yes. And what do you assess to be the level of risk that inflation surprises to the upside in this year? Well, I, I would say it this way. Um, my expectation is that um, we will see some relief on the supply side as the year goes on. By that, I mean global supply chains will start to loosen up. The shortages will start to be lesser. Um, if that doesn't happen and we see, if we see inflation becoming even more persistent and even higher, um, then I think the risk of it becoming entrenched in, 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 in the psychology of businesses and households and people, I think that, that, uh, that increases and that would indicate that we would respond. Thank you, Chair Powell. And, uh, you've noted that uh, the Fed and many mainstream economic forecasters had difficulty <clears throat> anticipating uh, the supply chain bottlenecks, uh, the labor shortages, the difficulty with which the global economy would add supply in response uh, to the return of demand and demand uh, stimulated by uh, government policy. Um, how can the Fed improve its modeling such that it's not surprised by those macroeconomic dynamics in a future crisis? So I, I think um, this is a unique situation. Um, we, we don't have um, 10 pandemics to look back on and say, oh, these are the common features when the global economy shuts down to deal with a global pandemic. It was all just new. And um, it wasn't the problem, strictly speaking, isn't the models, it's the assumptions you put in the models, right? So I, I wouldn't blame the models. Really, it just is that we and other forecasters, we believed, um, based on our analysis and discussions with people in industry, that the, that the um, supply side issues would be alleviated more quickly than now appears to be the case, substantially more quickly. We believed that we would have seen material relief on the supply side. We also thought, um, you know, by the end of last year, we also thought that there would be a, a, a much more significant uh, return to the workforce than, than has turned out to be the case. And while that's not what's causing current inflation, it is, it is more the demand, kind of demand side issue that um, you know, uh, labor supply can be an issue going forward for inflation, probably more than these supply side issues, these uh, supply chain issues that we're seeing. So we, we, we assumed, we believed that we would see these things, and you know, the, the, the data have come in pretty consistently showing that, uh, that the supply side challenges are more persistent and more substantial than we'd expected. Thank you, Chair Powell. I want to discuss with you uh, the institutional integrity, <clears throat> public confidence in institutions, uh, ethics among those who hold high office and have privileged access to information. Um, I'm an advocate for uh, banning stock trading by members of Congress who make policy, who have 
access to information and economic forecasting, uh, and banning stock trading by their spouses. And I will be introducing legislation this week uh, intending to make that the law with penalties for members of Congress who uh, violate those new rules. Uh, we had this week the resignation of another senior Fed official uh, related to controversy about uh, their stock trading. How widespread is the practice of uh, stock trading, management of one's own portfolio at senior levels in the Fed? Do you agree that it um, it, it undermines public confidence in the institution. Will you work with this committee um, to uh, advance legislation? I know the chairman has proposed some to end that practice. And will you comply with any lawful requests or commands for records or information by this or other congressional committees to examine those trades and their propriety? Well, uh, to the latter, of course, we will do that. Uh, but so I, I would just point out we have um, – um, immediately upon the emergence of these uh, facts, um, we began to devise a brand new system of, of governing um, investment by principals and senior staff associated with the FOMC. That, is, that process is very far along. It's nearing completion. I've al we've already announced the, the, the contours of it, and it effectively ends any ability to actively trade on the part of any senior Fed official, either FOMC member or senior staff. Um, you can't purchase any equities. If you bring equities to the, uh, you know, to the Fed, ownership of equities to the Fed, of course, they can't be in banks or anything like that, but you can sell them. But if you want to sell or buy anything, you have to give 45 days notice and then, and it's non-discretionary. Once you say you're going to do that, um, then you then those securities will be bought or sold in 45 days. So there's no ability to time the market. In, all, in addition, um, we're going to have a group at the Board of Governors here in Washington that's that's pre-clearing trades, all trades, and is and is um, you know in a position to apply the rules consistently across the system. And I really think this is this is the strongest system I've seen in place. For, certainly for a government agency, and I think it, it really does address the, the current, it rises to the current situation. I, I completely agree that, that the public's faith that we are working in, in to their benefit is absolutely critical. Thank you, Chair Powell. Will you provide the outlines of that proposal to this committee as soon as possible? I, we've already announced it, and we're, 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 all, we're very much at the point of of being ready to adopt it, and uh, but of course we'd be delighted to uh, to share yeah, that. Looking with you. forward to seeing the details. It is vital that the public understand that those in positions of power uh, are not trading based upon access to information that the general public does not have. Thank you, Chair Powell, for your testimony today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The senator from that Senator Danes from Montana is recognized. Chairman, thank you. I want to start by expressing my continued concerns my colleagues have had with inflation we're seeing in the economy. Uh, the last time you were here before the committee, real wages were down. Well, they're still down as we sit here today. 1.9% over the course of 2021, to be more precise, and I believe it's a direct result of this inflation that we are seeing. CPI inflation grew by 6.8% year-over-year in November. Tomorrow morning, we're going to get the CPI reading for December. I think we all know it's not going to be good news for hardworking Montanans, hardworking Americans who are seeing their wages eaten away month after month by inflation. Economists are projecting that CPI inflation will rise about a half a percent on a month-to-month -month basis in December, which will leave CPI inflation up at 7.1% in 2021. This would be the biggest annual increase in 40 years and is well above the Federal Reserve's 2% target. This, of course, is not that surprising to many of us who were here in this very room who warned this would happen when our Democrat colleagues passed this very reckless $1.9 trillion spending package in March of last year when the economic recovery was already well underway, and we pointed out there was nearly a trillion dollars of unspent funds coming into calendar year 21. And the Democrats on a purely partisan basis pushed another $1.9 trillion 
of reckless spending in March. Frankly, we should be thankful at this moment that the most recent multi-trillion dollar reckless tax and spending spree package did not pass last year, as that would only worsen the problems we are seeing today. I trust the Federal Reserve is on the case to address this inflation. I want to make sure that we here in Congress don't do anything to make your job more difficult than it already is. Moving away from inflation, I'd like to briefly address the Federal Reserve's dual mandate. Chairman Powell, I think it's safe to say the Federal Reserve has its hands full already trying to achieve its statutorily mandated goals of promoting maximum employment and stable prices. However, many have called for expanding the Fed's role to wade into politically charged issues for the first time. The Federal Reserve has a long history of political independence, and I worry that independence could easily be undermined. Chairman Powell, will you commit to strictly following the Fed's dual mandate and not expanding it in ways that are not clearly supported by the law? Yes. I know Senator Crapo mentioned this earlier, so I will just add briefly to his remarks on the Fed's report on the costs and benefits of a central bank digital currency. It's a topic that we want to start discussing here, so it will be helpful to have the Federal Reserve's insights. And I very much appreciate that you are working to get this report out in the next few weeks. My question, Mr. Chairman, is the FSOC recently designated climate change as an emerging threat to financial stability. Can you describe a sequence of climate-related events that would cause a financial crisis? So it's a, it's a good question. The, um, the way there's, there are two different kinds of risk, right? There's, there's physical risk and then there's transition risk. So physical risk tends to be uh, these, you know, these risks in the form of extreme weather and that kind of thing, and they kind of accumulate over time gradually. And to, to have a financial stability disruption, something that actually threatens the financial system, it, can't, it, it, it doesn't result from that kind of a process. So it doesn't seem likely in the near term that it would come from physical risk. So that means the real risk would be transition risk. And, and what that means is, is something, some surprising event would have to take place that destabilized the whole financial system and maybe caused a very large financial institution to fail in a disorderly way. How would that happen? <clears throat> um, it conceivably could happen through government policy, a, 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 uh, or it could come through an event, some kind of a public event that, that really uh, not unlike the pandemic, only related to climate in some way. So those are the, those are the kinds of things. It's, it, these are not things that we think about it will happen every day. But, uh, you know, it's more a question of over time um, what can happen from, from climate. So just a, a, a <clears throat> follow-up to that. Uh, this morning I was uh, with uh, Chairman Manchin of the Energy and Natural Resource Committee, which I serve on. We had a hearing on uh, hydropower. And there is a movement afoot in this country to breach hydropower dams, to breach dams. Uh, we've already seen blackouts in the U.S. and other countries because of forced closures of reliable baseload energy, whether it's been nuclear plants that have been shut down, coal plants have been shut down. They're talking about breaching dams. Uh, do you think that rolling blackouts due to a lack of stable baseload power poses a more tangible and real near-term near threat to the stability of the financial system? I have to think about that. I, I will say that to, to have a successful, if, you, if, you, if you're someone who wants to see a transition away from carbon-based energy, um, you know, we're going to need a lot of energy to, to facilitate that transition. And, to, and, and I think that means we need to be honest about having to rely on more traditional kinds of power. Yeah, it, what, what's mind-boggling to me, and this will be my last comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'll finish, but what's mind-boggling means we have sources of energy that do not emit carbon, like nuclear, like hydropower, 
And yet we see these ideological movements that are seeking to shut down nuclear plants, shut down hydropower in some cases, which uh, I think pose a significant risk to the stability of the grid as well as to our financial system. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thanks, Senator Daines. Uh, Senator uh, Toomey is recognized for one last round of questioning, and then I will finish up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I want to start by just underscoring a point that Senator Daines just made, which I think is extremely important, and we really, it, it, I don't think we made it until he made that point, which is that every month that goes by in which inflation in the form of consumer prices is growing faster than wages are gaining is a month in which workers are falling behind. There have been some comment about wage gains. I think we'd all like to see wage gains, but wage gains that are more than wiped out by price increases do not leave a family better off. And so it, it is not a contradiction. It is not somehow contrary to the interest of a working family to get price stability. In fact, it's necessary for the well-being of the working families of Pennsylvania and America that we bring about price stability. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, two quick questions for you. One regarding a central bank digital currency. Uh, some have advocated, as you know, that this uh, that a central bank digital dollar be used and developed in such a fashion um, that uh, individual Americans have retail accounts with the Fed, and the Fed becomes the retail banker for America. It seems to me that there is absolutely nothing in the history, the experience, the expertise, the capabilities of the Fed that lend the Fed to being a retail bank. Is that, is that a fair observation? I, I would say it is, yes. Thank you. A second, uh, I know we're going to get our report soon, and I'm very much looking forward to this, as you and I have discussed. Um, but I wonder if you could um, respond to this. Uh, if Congress were to authorize and the Fed were to pursue a central bank digital dollar, is there anything about that that ought to preclude a well-regulated, privately issued stable coins from coexisting with a central bank digital dollar? No, not at all. all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Uh, Chair Paul, the, the recent, uh, you've been, you've, you've responded three times, I believe, to this issue, but I wanted to try to get a little more specificity uh, from Senator Cortez Masto, Senator Ossoff, Senator Warren. The recent revelations about the vice chair's financial transactions before the Fed uh, announced its extraordinary support of the economy in 2020 are pretty troubling, as you and I have talked and you've responded to here. After the initial fallout from Fed officials making stock trades, you announced stricter trading rules at the Fed. That was, I believe, in October. Those rules have still not been um, written, to my knowledge. Uh, we've not seen them, if they have been written, so they certainly obviously haven't been implemented. When will these rules, when will we see them, and when will they be put in place? Imminently. You know, we've tried to take care and write them correctly. They're complex. We have to hire people. We've got to build systems, and we've got to write rules. So we've been hard at work at that since October. We're ready to move ahead with that, and I would think it's uh, in the in the very near future. Okay, uh, we're we're watching. I I um I've been with several of my colleagues, Senator Warnock, Senator Ossoff, as mentioned it, uh, his bill and our bill um, complement and and um, do some of the same things. The importance of banning conflicting trading at the Fed. Uh, we should move also on our with our colleagues too. So um, that's. That's a next step in this. I, I, I want to, before closing, address one issue that came up today. You've said banks were well capitalized during the pandemic. They had one of their most profitable years ever. But the largest banks still are spending it on stock buybacks and bigger dividends while still demanding relief for policy measures because of the volume of the deposits they're taking in. Government help can be necessary, but they don't need government help now. They should scale back. They could and should and, sh and, and can. Uh, scale back their stock buybacks. Banks could use that capital to increase lending to small businesses, 
mom and pop manufacturers. We've seen manufacturing wages, which used to be the highest wages in our economy for, for, um, particularly for sort of moderate income people. We've seen that slide back in part because mom and pap, pop manufacturers critical of the supply chain uh, are not always getting the access to capital they should. We can, we should see, use that capital to increase lending to invest in communities instead of enriching their executives while pushing to weaken resiliency of our banking system. The Fed needs to strengthen, not weaken capital requirements. It's the job of our banking system to support the real economy, not executive stock portfolios. That's what this comes down to. Everything the Fed does needs to support the economy so that it works for all Americans, workers, small businesses, their communities. That's the Fed. You must lead if confirmed. I plan to support your confirmation. Um, I'm counting on this as, as most of us in the Senate are. So, Chair Powell, thank you for being here today. Thank you for providing testimony. Senators who wish to submit questions for the hearing record, those questions are due at the close of business on Friday, the 14th of January. To the nominees, we'd like to have your responses by Wednesday, January 19th. Uh, thank you again for your testimony today. The Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.